man defeated them in the heat of the sun. Okay, that's African genius being transformed from eight here to three here. One man. That's African genius. That's what I'm into. That's what I want to talk about. Now, how does Columbus fit into this? Where's Columbus coming at? What was happening? We gotta go to the facts. Can't talk if you can't back up. Gotta go to the facts. January 1492. What happened January 2nd? The Moors, in partnership with the Arabs, were expelled from Spain. What happened? How does Columbus come into this? Christopher Columbus, who was also known as Christopher Cologne, Cologne means dove and Christopher means Christ. Dove of Christ, aka known as Christopher Columbus. It was Christopher Columbus that went in. Where's my sources? The Diaries, Voyages, and Journals of Columbus by John Boyd Patchett. That is 2,114 pages. The footnotes by itself is another book within itself. You can get lost just in the footnotes. Now go back and read that came before Columbus by Dr. Ivan Van Silver. Read all of chapter one. He based that whole chapter off of that book by John Boyd Thatcher. But it is Columbus who says that he witnessed the expulsion of these Moors. Not only did he witness this, but he wrote about it. Who was the last king of Ragnarok? You see, Dr. Van Sertima book, it was called the African General Boat at Bill, also known as Abu, who surrenders to, the, to Queen Isabella and Ferdinand. He's an African general, and you know Dr. Van Sertima is very good, and he says if he can't back it up. That's the last general of Granada. Christopher Columbus seen when this man was expelled from Spain. Not only did he see it and bear witness to it, he wrote about it. The sad part about this gentleman is that at that time you had the two predominantly African dynasties, the Amoravids and the Amahadids, strictly African dynasties. They said to Queen Isabella and Ferdinand, the king and queen of Spain, if you want Granada, you come get it. And we're going to die, but if we die, we're going to die as strong African men and women. What did the African general do? He tried to make concessions with King, uh, King Ferdinand. What did he say? Perhaps we can make some type of a deal. If you give me a certain part of my land, if you give me certain things, if you let me keep the religion, then I will release one out. The masses didn't want to buy that. They didn't even know he was making a deal. Queen King Ferdinand seen the dispute between the masses, Africans, and their leader, Mo Abdul. What did he say? Look, I'm not waiting for them to decide what they're going to do. Let's go after them. They fought. The sad part is that the Africans eventually were defeated. Not only were they defeated, but then they said that this general, he weak. He was sad. He didn't like what was going on. It hurt in him. And if you understand it, you see the architect of Granada. You see that grand door, that magnificent, magnificent structure. You will see why he was hurt. Unbelievable when you see what that looked like. It was built right around the time of that Amoradi and Amahadi's dynasty. But his mother, Aisha, said to him, and she was right, you weep like a woman for what you could not defend as a man. And this same African general died in another war helping another African kinsman. But yet and still, he felt a non violent person that, you know, it's better if I can make some type of deal with the king and queen of Spain. Now, it's January 2nd, 1492. Columbus sees this, he witnessed this, and I'd like to read to you what he said. I'm reading from page 286. You have to hear this. Word for word, this is Columbus. I'm quoting strictly from Columbus. It's in Spanish and it's in English. He sat there and he bear witness to this. And the sad part, the reason why this is sad, because Columbus also said, in my intercourse and conversations, I have been with learned patients, as ecclesiastical as well as circular. I learned from Indians and Moors. I study history and philosophy. I sat at the foot of the Moors. So he's telling you that he learned from the Moors, but yet and still, he witnessed their expulsion. And I'm going to read to you what he says. Page 435, I'm sorry, page 435, chapter 1. This is what he said. 
Listen to this. January 2nd. What? This is Columbus. He sees this. Because most Christians are very exalted and very excellent and very powerful princes, king and queen of the Spains and of the islands of the sea, our Lord, in the present year of 1492, after your highness has made an end to the war of the Moors, who are reigning in Europe, and having finished the war in the very great city of Granada, where, in this present year, on the second day of the month of January, I saw the royal banners of your highness placed by force of arms on the towers of Alhambra to the gates of the city. Let me start over. I saw the royal banners of your highness placed by force of arms on the towers of Alhambra, which is the fortress of the said city, and I saw the Moorish king come out to the gates of the city and kiss the royal hands of your highness and of the prince, Lord, and then in that same month, because of this information which I have given your highness about the lands of India. So he witnessed the expulsion of the Moors, and the same man said he said, and learned extensively from the Moors, and turned the other sheep. So what happens now? 1492, Columbus, he begins to do what? He seeks money, funds, <coughs> to travel and make his voice of contact to the new world. Finally, the Moors are expelled, the king and queen decides to give him finance to what he needs, among other people who gave him finance. Now he's on his way. I'm not the first one who mentioned Africans in America before Columbus on his second voyage, and what is called Haiti, back then called Hispaniola. It was Christopher Columbus who went there on his second voyage, and it was the Indians, the Native Americans, who told him that black people were coming from the south and southwest in large groups trading gold tipped metal spears. Now, at that time, he wasn't sure if they were Africans. He felt that maybe they could have been Native Americans or Indians with dark skin. However, it was the Spanish metal merchants who took those gold-tipped metal spears back to Spain, had them analyzed, and found that they had their same copper, not similar, the same identical alloy of copper, gold, and silver ratio that was being alloyed and produced on the west coast of Guinea. Furthermore, the Native Americans was using the same word for gold tipped metal spears, guanin, guane, kane, and it has the linguistic similarity as that of the West Coast of India. Not only that, but you have three major currents. Three currents. You have the Senegambia current, you have the Cape Verde current, you have the South Equatorial current, and actually four, you have the Canary Islands. These are four major hey, hey, currents right off the coast of Africa. If you get caught in these currents, whether you're a bone, a stick, a nail, whatever, if the fish don't eat you first, you will automatically come to America. These currents, and I should show you this, four currents. In fact, Canary Islands, Cape Verde, Sydney Gambia, all right here, natural currents that will automatically bring you into South America. The canary currents go southward, off the coast of uh, the Cape Verde, and it gets its currents from sitting down here and will bring you right into South America. Then you have the Cape Verde. It leaves Africa, it leaves Africa into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico, it swings back off the Florida coast, and then it comes back over the Europe and Africa. You have the city down there current. It takes you into South America, into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico, and it possibly swings back. The South Equal Tourism takes you into the Gulf of Mexico, into the Caribbean. Four natural currents. Furthermore, Africa has the advantage because at its nearest point, it is only 1,500 miles away from South America. Europe is twice as far, as long as you have natural currents. Furthermore, in 1462, the Portuguese noticed a whole lot of cotton that was being planted or that was being grown. And it, uh, the Cape, uh, Canary Islands, which is right off the African coast. And they thought that this was indigenous. They thought this was an African cotton. But they found out they were wrong. And as you have heard through Dr. Ivan Van Sigmund, this was, a, early, this was a, a foreign cotton. It was called Garcipium Persutum Barbustatum. This was an American cotton that made its way into Africa. Then you had an African cotton, cultivated cotton, Garcipium Persutum 
and God, God sent them Barbara Dennis that merged, and they had a new copy. We had, and they tested this. They had 26 chromosomes, 13 African and 13 European. Now, at first, they felt, well, we're not sure if, in fact, Africans brought it here. It could have came here by way of a transatlantic voice. Maybe the currents brought this in. And they tested this. Found out it didn't happen. They tested it. And what did they look for? Three things. Buoyancy. What is buoyancy? The tendency or capacity for cotton seeds to remain a fruit. Viability. Are they capable of living? Are they capable of developing? Under favorable conditions. Okay? They found out that when they tried these and tested these in salt water, the cotton sank. Wow. So how the hell did he get over here then? Well, I'm going to go ahead and cut it. Well, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and cut it and go on to part two. I'm going to take out right where my man's left off at. Now, if you want to see him on YouTube, I gave, I gave you guys the link to go on YouTube and uh, actually see what this brother looked like. He got the information. He got the evidence. He got proof of everything that he's talking about. Okay? Um, Go ahead and... Get ready for part two, okay?